great thanks very much i'm excited to see how the the day unfolds here looks like a great great program so for most animals movements or sensory information is acquired in the context of movements or an exploration so think of active touch exploring a surface with your fingers or a rat or a mouse exploring with his whiskers think of eye movements and vision or movements of the head and the ears in hearing. So in all of these cases, movements allow animals to acquire more and better information about the world, but they also pose a fundamental challenge for sensory systems. So sensory systems in the brain have to distinguish between patterns of receptor activation due to external behavior that be relevant events, so stimulus out in the world, from patterns of receptor activation that may be similar or identical that are a direct consequence of the animal's own behavior and movements. And these are classically termed reafferents. And a classical solution to this so-called problem of reafferents is that sensory centers in the brain, in addition to receiving this ambiguous sensory input, could also receive additional information in the form of copies of motor commands. These have been called efferents copy. I'll refer to them today as corollary discharges. So the idea is that sensory regions could use this corollary discharge to generate a model that predicts the sensory consequences of motor commands. And these ideas were formulated first by Sperry, von Holst, and Middlestadt in the 50s. And I'll read you this quote quickly. Uh, so we shall propose that the efference, this is a motor output, leaves an image of itself somewhere in the CNS to which the reafference of this movement compares as the negative of a photograph compares to its print so that when superimposed, the image disappears. So this is an early formulation of the idea of a forward model or a prediction of the sensory consequences of a motor command. And this is going to be my entry point into internal models today. And it turns out that a really good place to study this kind of model is in this unusual creature that is a focus of research in my lab, this weakly electric fish from Africa. So for the rest of the talk, we'll dive into the, the, the unusual sensory motor systems of this fish, and I'll try to give you a detailed mechanistic picture of how kind of simple internal model is generated in the brain of this, of this creature. So these electric fish have receptors scattered over their skin that are sensitive to weak electrical fields. Uh, for example, fields emitted by other animals in the water, like a bug that this fish might want to eat. These are called passive electroreceptors. And this fish is special because he also has an electric organ, so a modified muscle in his tail that emits a weak electrical field, and he uses this to communicate with other fish and also to actively electrolocate via a second class of electroreceptors that I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the talk. But in the beginning, we're going to be focused on the plight of the passive electrosensory system. And the, from the perspective of this system, the fish's large electric organ discharge pulse is a severe source of self-generated noise. So this is a histogram of the spiking response of one of these passive electroreceptors. And after each electric organ discharge or EOD pulse, this receptor is sent into this ringing pattern of activation. And this is a problem, a particular problem for a couple of reasons. This perturbation of the receptor response is long lasting in time. So it lasts around 200 milliseconds, which is about the same duration as the, or same interval as the fish is pulsing. So if he simply gated this interference out, there'd be no time left to sense the world. So that solution is not gonna work. Um, another problem is that this interference pattern is not fixed, but changes depending on the environment on multiple time scales. And in this example, we see that changes in water conductivity have a large effect on how this electric organ discharge will affect these electroreceptors. So the fish may need to learn the sensory consequences of these own electric organ discharge. And what I'll tell you now is our understanding of how this learning actually occurs. Uh, and fortunately for us, it seems that a lot is done at the very first stage of electrosensory processing in a central brain structure called the electrosensory lobe, so ELL for short. And the two major inputs to ELL are sensory input from receptors on the skin that I've talked about, and then also a corollary discharge or a copy of the motor command that discharges the electric organ. So the motor command nucleus sends a command down the spinal cord to the electric organ in the tail, and then a copy up into ELL. And so through lots of study of this structure, we know a lot at the cellular and circuit level as well. So a main site of integration of the electrosensory input and the corollary discharge input are these cell types here, the medium ganglion cells that I'll talk about uh, at length today. 
And these cells are interesting because they receive their corollary discharge input via a mossy fiber granule cell parallel fiber system that closely resembles to the circuitry of the cerebellum. So we refer, we refer to the ELL as a cerebellum-like sensory structure. So we believe some of the insights, and we'll come back to this, some of the insights from ELL may be relevant to understanding how internal models are formed in the cerebellum. So I'm going to summarize now about uh, three decades' worth of work on our understanding of how this process of negative image formation, forward models, happens in the structure of ELL. And this is largely work of Curtis Bell and his colleagues. So remember, the problem is that after each EOD command, there's this ringing pattern of activation that the system should cancel out if it wants to perceive events in the world. So the problem reduces to forming a temporally specific negative image and if the system could do that perfectly, if it could create an opposite temporal pattern and subtract that from the incoming effect of the EOD, then the output of these MG cells would be flat and they would be sensitive, they'd be poised to detect unexpected behaviorally relevant events in the world. And so do we actually have any evidence uh, that this happens, and of course we do, this is why we're studying this strange fish, is that you can actually record these negative images uh, from these MG cells in vivo and see the formation of these negative images in real time. Okay, so you can record from the cell. Initially, the effects of the corollary discharge are minimal, so this is a spike raster triggered on the time of the EOD command in a paralyzed fish in which the EOD, the emission of the EOD is blocked. If you add a mimic of the fish's EOD, which is shown by the line here, you can strongly drive acti activity in the cell, a pause, and then an excitation, that pattern diminishes over time, and then when you turn the stimulus off, so when you again look at just the effects of the corollary discharge alone, you see here an opposite pattern, and this is what we refer to as the negative image. So the point is that you can actually study these negative images and observe them. They're all correlates uh, in real time, so that's the strength of the system. So the first insight into the cellular mechanisms came from slice studies uh, that showed that the synapses conveying the corollary discharge information to the MG cells are plastic. So they're modified by recent activity, and the form of this plasticity was particularly, in particularly interesting. It was an anti-Hebbian form of spike timing dependent plasticity. So in this kind of plasticity rule, presynaptic inputs that come before or predict a postsynaptic spike are weakened. Inputs coming in at different delays are strengthened. So this kind of anti-Hebbian rule <coughs> is perfect for removing correlations between pre- and postsynaptic activity. And intriguingly, it was just the kind of learning rule that you would need to generate a negative image. So this is, this is the learning rule. Uh, so the next important piece of the puzzle, this was a collaboration with uh, Patrick Roberts, and who did some elegant modeling work that showed if, in addition to this learning rule, you had an explicit representation of time in the granule cells, so and this <laughs> schematic, he thought about it in terms of a delay line representation, that with this representation of time and this learning rule, you could account for the formation of these temporally specific negative images that were observed in, in vivo. Okay, so this is a basic model of how this process of negative images could work. Uh, and this is kind of where the talk today and our work comes in is to fill in this missing piece of the puzzle here. So the delay line representation was a hypothetical idea. We didn't know how corollary discharges are actually represented uh, and transformed in the granule cells. So like the cerebellum, the granule cells in this electric fish are tiny neurons. It's not trivial to monitor their activity. So this had remained kind of a mystery until recently. And it's important here because the EOD command itself, so the copy, the literal copy of the motor command is just a brief pulse. So just a couple spikes, very brief and restricted in time. So a copy of the motor command itself <coughs> is not in a suitable language. It's not a representation of time. So the question here, an important general question about uh, this kind of internal model is how do you go from a copy of a motor command into a prediction of a sensory consequence? The two things are in quite different languages. So this is part of the, the mystery that we're going to try to address today at the circuit level. Okay, so our approach to this was uh, straightforward, if somewhat tedious one. So what we wanted to do is to look at the activity, the corollary discharge representations in the granular layer cell by cell, and the key cells are the granule cells themselves, which are the 
cells that give rise to the parallel fibers that send input to the Mg cells. So in the cerebellum, this would be a Purkinje cell. And in addition, the key elements that provide the input to the granule cells. So these are the mossy fibers. These provide excitatory input to the granule cells. These are the, the inputs that are conveying the copy of the motor command from the motor centers. And then in addition, two important classes of interneurons, the only interneurons in the granular layer, both in mammals and in the electric fish, inhibitory Golgi cells, and then unipolar brush cells, which are excitatory interneurons that give rise to intrinsic mossy fibers, system that also provide uh, excitation to the granule cells. So we wanted to look at the corollary discharge representations in these classes of neurons. Uh, so we did this in a preparation of paralyzed fish in which the electric organ discharge itself is blocked, but the fish is awake and he continues to spontaneously emit the motor command to discharge the electric organ. Okay, we can measure this motor command with an electrode near the tail, and so we have a fictive preparation in which it's straightforward for us to look at corollary discharge because there is no sensory consequence of the motor command in this prep. So it's a good prep to look at corollary discharge response, which is anything locked to the fish's motor command. Okay. So what do we see? So first, when we saw, when we recorded from the, the mossy fibers, the inputs from uh, the motor command centers, we saw, as expected, that the responses, and these are spike histograms here on the left, examples, and then here's a summary of all the cells we recorded in the form of color plots, so each row is a cell. And so, as expected, we saw that the external inputs were restricted in time. So, inputs from the motor co command centers indeed resemble literal copies of the motor commands. Their responses were highly stereotyped. And interestingly, as we recorded inside, uh, inside of the granular layer, which we call EGP, so when we recorded inside of this granular layer, we found these kind of responses, these early responses, but in addition, we saw responses that were more temporally diverse and delayed. And so we have some examples of these responses here. There's a cell that is bursting later in the command cycle, a cells that fire tonically, the pause, and then fire this ringing pattern of activation after the command. So these seem to be potentially raw material for the temporally specific negative images that we know the fish can form. And one of the first findings that we made using a combination of extracellular and intracellular recordings was that the source of these diverse and delayed temporal responses were this class of interneuron called the unipolar brush cell. So this was kind of unexpected, but interesting for us that the temporal diversity <coughs> seemed to be coming from these cells intrinsic to the granular layer. Uh, some theories of cerebellum uh, hypothesized that Golgi cells might play this kind of a role. And in our system, we saw Golgi cell responses were mainly temporally restricted. So the first finding is that there is temporal diversity in the granular layer, and it may be generated by these unipolar brush cells. And we got a little bit of additional insight into this from some of our intracellular recordings from these unipolar brush cells. And some of these cells, we found that hyperpolarizing the cell via a current injection caused a large burst of spikes when the hyperpolarization was terminated. And if we looked at the same responses of these same cells to the EOD motor command, we saw that cells fired largest burst when they were most hyperpolarized. So suggestive, again, of a rebound from inhibition kind of mechanism. So the point of all this is just that the intrinsic synaptic uh, properties of these unipolar brush cells may themselves be sufficient for generating temporal diversity in the granular layer. And people that have looked at these cells uh, in mammals and in, in vitro work have come to similar conclusions that these cells have quite interesting synaptic and intrinsic properties. So it may be that these unipolar brush cells have a dedicated channel for injecting temporal diversity uh, in, into the granular layer. So the important output of the granular layer are, of course, the granule cells themselves. So we next turned our attention to what's happening uh, in these cells. Here I've selected a few traces. These are the average membrane potentials of granule cells uh, locked to the EOD motor demand. And we see a few things. Uh, we see responses that are quite early that resemble the responses of the mossy fibers coming from the motor command center. But in addition, we see other patterns of activation that are more diverse and delayed. So here we see a cell that seems to be paused, hyperpolarized early and shows this oscillating pattern of activity that's reminiscent of some of the mossy fiber and the unipolar brush cell inputs that I showed you a minute ago, other cells that are most active late. So this is interesting. If we look at a whole, 
at the granule cells. So this is 200 granule cells, the total that we recorded. Uh, we see these same features, but also something important and additional, and that is that the large majority of the granule cells are active uh, only at a very short delay. So we see kind of a mixed picture here. On the one hand, we have some temporal diversity in the responses, so some activity late that could contribute to temporally specific negative images, delayed responses, but also a majority of cells whose activation is restricted to early delay. So this is not a delay line representation uh, that was predicted by or was used in early <coughs> modeling work that we know could explain negative images, but quite a different type of representation. So the question then for us becomes uh, one of asking, is this representation that we now have observed suitable for generating negative images via the learning rule that we've measured? So the key ingredients, key ingredients are known, a temporal basis, a learning rule, and we want to know now, can we explain uh, these negative images? Uh, so we know with a delay line that we could account for these, but can we exp is this temporal basis a suitable one? Uh, so for this question, we had a couple choices. One of the challenges is that where we, whereas we recorded 200 granule cells, one <coughs> NG cell receives 20,000 granule cell inputs, and this is similar to the massive convergence of granule cells onto Purkinje cells in cerebellum. So there's a gap between the data we can record and the raw material uh, for the negative images in the actual system. So we had you know, two choices. One was to return to the lab and record for the remaining 18,000 or so granule cells. Another choice was to turn to a different approach. And so we thought about that and went across the street and talked to Larry Abbott and some of uh, his bright students in the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, Ann Kennedy, Patrick, and Greg. And we thought we could come up with a plan together of how to bridge this explanatory gap between these pieces of the puzzle that we could measure and the output of the system, the negative images that we want to understand. Uh, so we were aided in this pursuit by the fact that the granule cells, and these are the first, you know, the first cells that we're going to try to understand uh, using the model, modeling approach, are very simple cells. Each granule cell just gets a handful of excitatory inputs, two to four, on these claw-like dendrites. So this is where the excitatory mossy fiber or the excitatory unipolar brush cell input synapses. And so interestingly, what we found <coughs> was that if we looked at the responses from the granule cells that we measured, so this is the member, measured membrane potential response, and then we carefully selected using uh, sparse regression techniques an appropriate one, two, or three recorded mossy fiber or UBC inputs that we could account for the response simply by summating excitatory inputs. So here is a model fit in green that was achieved just by appropriately selecting and summing two recorded mossy fiber or UBC inputs. So this is an early mossy fiber from extrinsic source. This is one of the putative unipolar brush cells within EGP. If we add these two inputs together as they're added in the actual cell, we can account for the response. Uh, so we could do this for all of the granule cells that we recorded from. Here's a sample of the actual responses in blue, the bits in green, and then the assignment or the selected mossy fiber or UBC inputs, one, two, or three, that explain that response. So there's two values to this exercise. One is that we have a better understanding of how the temporal responses in these granule cells actually arise. So this is an important question also in the cerebellum. The cerebellum, most of the three quarters of the neurons in your brain are these cerebellar granule cells. We know very little bit about the transformations that are performed in the granular layer and what these granule cells actually represent. So here we have a picture of how inputs to the granular layer, corollary discharge inputs, are transformed into postsynaptic granule cell responses via these simple rules. And then more germane to our goal, our immediate goal here of explaining negative images, is that this model gave us a tool uh, that allowed us to bridge this gap between the 200 granule cells we could record and the 20,000 granule cells that form a basis for negative images. And so we did this by inverting the model. And so now, because we understand the basic rules through which mossy fibers and UBC inputs generate granule cell responses, we could now construct our own granule cells. And so we're using recorded mossy fiber and UBC data mixed together uh, in a fashion consistent with the, the, uh, this fitting procedure that we saw work so well, and we can construct artificial granule cells. So here's two recorded inputs, 
uh, selected, summed together. Here's the response of a model granule cell. This one happens to spike kind of at a medium delay after the motor command. So of course we want it to check, uh, check the synthetic constructed cells against the recorded cells. Here's a selection of around 200 out of 20,000 of these generated granule cells compared to the actual cells responses that we measured. Again, this is a membrane potential of the cell after the time after the motor command on the x-axis here. And you see there's a pretty good resemblance between the recorded cells and these selected <coughs> cells. And these 20, 000, this selection of the 20,000 was made randomly, so we didn't pick this to look like the actual cells. So with this in hand, we have a good tool now to probe the question that we sought out to, to look at initially. Can this basis account for negative images together with the learning rule? So now if we plug in our 20,000 granule cells, pass them through plastic synapses, we can, at least in a model, have a more direct approach to this question. And that's what we did. This is work of Ann Kennedy. So I'm showing you now uh, the output of a model MG cell receives 20,000 granule cell inputs. The strength of these inputs is adjusted according to the measured anti-Hebbian synaptic plasticity rule. And we can see at the first time point here in the model, we introduce uh, an input to the model that represents the self-generated effects of the electric organ discharge. So the, in the color scheme here, you see what is the ringing pattern of activation that's due uh, to the effects of the EOD on the receptors. And then over the course of uh, a few hundred trials, so this is a similar time scale to that over in which we see negative images forming in vivo, you see that the effects of the EOD diminish and go away. So the system is this model, on the model we see the expected cancellation of the sensory consequences of the EOD. If we turn the effects, if we turn the EOD off, what we see underneath is a temporally specific negative image. So that's the dashed blue line here. It's opposite of the effect of the sensory input on the MG cell, and this is exactly what we see in vivo. So to a first pass, we think that even though this temporal basis is not a delay line. It does seem to be able to explain negative images that we see in vivo. So this is encouraging. And we could take the model a little bit further to gain some insight into why this temporal basis that we recorded, this pattern of granule cell activation, works as well as it does. So to address this question, Anne asked about the quality and the rate of the sensory cancellation. Uh, for inputs that resemble the effects of the EOD on electroreceptors, so this black line here. So in the real system, the EOD pulse comes in shortly after the motor command. The largest effect is at a short delay, and then there's this ringing pattern, so the effect diminishes over time. So she compared the effects of this pattern, the ability of the system to cancel this pattern, with the ability of the system to cancel artificial signals that were matched in their power spectrum but shifted in phase. So in blue, we see a family of artificial signals that the fish would not ever encounter in nature, but were similar in their, in their power spectrum. And what she saw in this case was the cancellation proceeded at a faster rate and was more effective for the natural signal than for these artificial signals. So this is uh, not unexpected, but it points to kind of the conclusion that the reason why this basis may work so well in this fish is that it's matched to the structure of the input. So this is maybe kind of an interesting general lesson that representations needn't be all purpose like a delay line, but if the representations are suited to the particular problem that the system faces, maybe you can do just as well. And that's kind of what we see here. The green line in the model is a case where we deleted the UBCs from the model, and this provides additional confirmation that their role in generating these delayed and diverse responses was important, you know, as we expected. Okay, so our knowledge you know, of the key ingredients in this circuit of the granule cell representations in the learning rule also provides us with an opportunity to make some very specific predictions about the capacity for forming negative images, the capacity for plasticity in the system. Uh, so we wanted to pursue this uh, in the last set of experiments. So for these set of experiments, instead of delivering a natural sensory input to the MG cell, we asked about its capacity to form negative images under artificial conditions in which we directly inject current into the cell to evoke action potentials locked to the EOD motor command. So this is kind of like asking about the impulse response of this system uh, when we're taking into account the capacity of the system to uh, to generate negative images. 
So what do we expect to be able to, what do we expect to happen in this situation? So the result of this kind of experiment where we're evoking a postsynaptic spike locked to the motor command, the plasticity we induce is going to depend on two factors that we've already discussed. One is the learning rule, and the other is the temporal patterns of response in the granule cells. Uh, we know both of these, so we should be able to predict what's going to happen in these kind of experiments. So first, for illustration, let's take the case of a delay line. So in this simple experiment, what would happen for a delay line kind of representation? So if we inject current and evoke a spike at a short delay after the motor command, granule cells that are active just before uh, the spike will be weakened, according to this anti hebbian spike timing dependent plasticity rule, over some minutes of pairing, these weakened synapses then will contribute to a hyperpolarization of the membrane potential of this cell. So when we turn the current injection off, we'll see a dip in the membrane potential. This is a, a simple uh, reduced form of the negative image. And we can repeat this experiment now, shifting the delay of the current injection over in time. And if the basis was a delay line, if the representations were uniform in time, the learning rule is the same everywhere in time, we would simply see this dip translate across. Okay, so this is kind of the, the hypothesis from a delay line. But what do we expect given the actual representations in the granule cells that we observe? So these are far from a delay line. We see many more cells active early after the command than late, so we expect a different pattern. And because we know the learning rule, we can quantitatively predict what the pattern of change should be, and that's what we did. So for an experiment in which we pair with a uh, current injection at 125 milliseconds, if the granule cells were a delay line, we'd expect to see a temporally specific depression at a long delay, but given the granule cell responses that we actually observe, we expect quite this different pattern. So a biphasic pattern where we have an excitation early, and this is due to the non-associative potentiation, part of the learning rule acting on the large number of granule cells that are active early in the command cycle, and then a, an associative depression due to the smaller number of cells that are active at long delays. So what do we see when we actually do this experiment? So here's the response. Before any pairing, we inject spikes. We inject current to evoke spikes at this long delay. And when we look at the change, post minus pre, we see a pattern of change, a negative image in this cell that's very much like the negative image that we predict based on the learning rule and the uneven pattern, temporal patterns of granule cells that we actually observe. So this is some kind of confirmation that our general understanding of the learning rule of the granule cell responses and how they contribute to the formation of these sensory predictions in this system is relatively, is relatively sound. Um, so we could repeat this experiment for a range of delays. The green is the prediction. The black is the change in the response after pairing. And we see that in all cases this agrees quite well with the predictions and is not what we would expect from a delay line. So in the case of this simple temporally specific negative image, we think we have, you know, to a first pass, a pretty good idea of actually how this works at the circuit level. So the animal can predict the sensory consequences of motor commands, subtract them out so he's more sensitive to the world, so he solves this problem of reafference. He solves the problem of translating a copy, a literal copy of a motor command into a language that can predict sensory consequences, and that's all done through these fairly simple mechanisms. Synaptic plasticity rule, in this case, the nature of the plasticity is critical. It's this anti hebbian synaptic plasticity, and that's acting on some kind of suitable representation. So corollary discharge representations <coughs> have been transformed in the circuitry of the granular layer, and this May, if you know something about the cerebellum, some of these basic pictures, some of these basic ingredients are very similar to models of the cerebellum. So one question you might have, and I'll talk for a few more minutes here uh, about this, is whether this very simple forward model, so in some ways you might think this is you know, kind of a trivial example of, a, of an internal model because the, this motor act uh, that's being, that, whose consequences are being predicted is completely stereotyped. So this is about the most simple motor act that you can imagine. It's simply an electrical pulse, and what we're predicting is just a pattern in one dimension of time. So in some sense, maybe one wonders whether these mechanisms that we've highlighted here uh, would actually work you know, in the context of generating, generating an internal model for, for motor control. So can you predict the sensory consequences of an arm movement where there's many more dimensions? And what's interesting to us is actually 
that in the fish and in ELL, we have a lot of evidence that the same system, the same circuitry solves more complex internal model problems, if you will, uh, than just this one that we've talked about so far. I've talked about the temporally specific negative images because we understand them the best, but we also know that for the active electrosensory system of this fish, uh, that the fish's own movements are a big source of, big source of self-generated noise. So remember, there's electroreceptors scattered over the skin. There's an electric organ in the tail. The active sense is geared toward detecting perturbations in the fish's self-generated field due to objects in the environment. So every time the fish moves, so every posture that he assumes that's a function of bending along in many joints of his body, there'll be a pattern of electrosensory <coughs> reafferents that the system needs to account for Account for if he is to detect objects in the environment. So it seems like the system somehow needs to learn the higher dimensional, more complex mapping between postures of the fish and the pattern, the spatial and temporal pattern of electrosensory input at each point on the skin of the fish. Okay, so can the fish do this? And we think it can, so I'll show you just quickly data from quite a few years ago where we actually asked this question directly, can the fish code information, can ELL neurons code information about objects in the environment irrespective of the movements of the animal? So in these experiments, we move an object, so behaviorally relevant stimulus, an object next to the face of the fish. At the same time, we're moving the tail of the fish back and forth. And in this situation, he's emitting an electric organ discharge, and so if we record the voltage on the skin, it changes both as a function of the position of the object, you can see that here, but also the position of the tail. So again, this is the problem of reafference for the fish, but now in the context of his own movements. Um, and then if we look at the responses in the brain, first at the skin, then at the level of the afferents, then at the ELL neurons, we see again an interesting transformation, as you'd expect, in terms of the, at the level of the current at the skin, you see a strong dependence of the field both on the position of the tail, so the gradient and the colors here, also the position of the object. Same thing at the level of the afferents, they have no way to distinguish self from other, so they respond strongly to both. But then if we look up at the level of ELL neurons, they seem to have solved this problem. They're showing variant responses to the object position, and they don't respond at all to the movements of the fishes own body to his own posture. So it seems like the system may also solve this problem. So I can just, you know, find, closing here, kind of recast this uh, problem in our same framework and kind of food for thought. Can these kind of simple mechanisms that we've talked about here, if we expand them a little bit, flesh them out, can they also account for more complex internal models? And that's something we're interested in the lab. So imagine the sensory input to the system now depends on joint angles. I'm just plotting two here, but there are many joint angles. So the reafference is a function of the different angles of the fish's body. That comes in. You need to generate some kind of literal negative image of that. Uh, and of course, you, know, you can imagine how we're going to do this in this simple model. We have the same learning rule that we know exists. And then we have some basis of body representations in the granule cells. And so I don't have time to go over all the evidence, but we have actually a lot of evidence that the main components of this model are also true in this system. So the learning rule is established. We know that granule cells, in addition to receiving corollary discharge inputs, also receive massive proprioceptive inputs that convey information about the fish's own position, different parts of his body, his tail, his trunk, his fins. They also receive motor commands related to his movement. So if we electrically stimulate from the brain, evoke a movement, then paralyze the fish, record from the granule cells, we see motor corollary discharge responses in the granule cells. So there seems to be evidence for this kind of basis of body position in the fish, and then just a little bit of evidence. So does the fish actually make negative images in this domain of body position? So here's four sets of experiments that we did in which we're now changing the amplitude of an electrosensory stimulus applied to the skin of the fish as a function of the position of the fish's tail. So the tail is either in the middle, in the ipsy position, or the contra position. And now we're varying the amplitude of a stimulus smoothly to create these profiles. So this is a manipulation of the sensory consequences of the fish's own movements, which are applied passively in these experiments. <coughs> if we do this for 10 or 15 minutes, now we turn the stimulus off, continue to move the body of the fish, we again see these quite nice negative images of the sensory consequences of the fish's own posture. So for us, this is some evidence that these basic ideas of negative images of simple forward model in this system could be expanded to more complex problems in higher dimensions. So we're very interested in an understanding 
know, how to bridge, as Mayor Dowd was saying, how do you bridge gaps between simple kind of circuit mechanisms like these and the more complex internal models that we imagine uh, we have uh, in our brains that we imagine the cerebellum perhaps is generating? So how do we bridge these levels? And so we think this system offers some potential uh, for doing this. And again, for us, uh, you know, of particular interest is the question of the cerebellum. So the circuitry we study in the electric fish is very like the cerebellum, in particular this massive layer of granule cells that provide plastic inputs converging on a readout neuron, a Purkinje cell, MG cell here, is very similar to the circuitry of the cerebellum. And you, know, you probably may have recognized if you know about the cerebellum, the structure of our model is just a, an implementation of supervised learning at ELL that's very, very similar to the classic Mar Albus models of the cerebellum. So there's nothing really new here. There's a lot of congruence between our ideas of plasticity and granule cell basis in ELL and the cerebellum. So those things are basically the same. On the other hand, there's kind of an interesting congruence in ideas about what the cerebellum is actually doing at a more systems level. The idea that the cerebellum, like what we've talked about for ELL, is a predictor of sensory consequences of motor commands or some kind of a forward model. So these things have kind of come evolved together. And for us, it's quite interesting then to think you know, how to bridge these gaps, how to extend ideas uh, from ELL, where it's quite easy to witness these these kind of forward models and see play these games that we played um, in this fish, how to extend this to more to internal models in the cerebellar circuitry and think about what you know, what we either learn or what important pieces are missing in, in terms of you know, bridging these kind of gaps. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh,